Stanford University. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, and as the title says, I'm going to talk about both the global problems and a specific project. Uh, so uh, to start with, about 2 billion people use a diversity of biomass fuels. And it's not always wood. It's wood and twigs. And the poorest of the poor uh, will even use dry litter, leaf litter. Uh, and of course, agricultural waste and animal dung mixed with uh, uh, animal dung mixed with soil to make it into dung cakes and charcoal. Uh, and with this diversity of biofuels, you know, these more than two billion people daily eat a meal uh, with a diversity of foods cooked in a diversity of ways, you know, baked or fried and, and on and on and on. And here is an example of the most common way in which uh, the food is cooked. Uh, the so-called three stone fire literally is three stones supporting a pot with a fire lit underneath. And it's the most ancient way of using fire for, for food. And it's also the least efficient and one of the most polluting. So here is a woman cooking, gives you an idea of how much smoke comes off from that stove with that kid sitting there. And, and of course, the kitchens have not generally uh, good ventilation. Uh, smoke inhalation uh, is the usual consequence. Uh, these two pictures are intended to primarily show you the enormous soot on the walls. Uh, in, in, there, is a, there is a woman cooking a fire, and you see the wall turned completely black. And same thing here with those two kind of uh, places where fire has been lighted. Uh, black carbon uh, are a significant contributor to climate forcing. So it's not only a contributor to poor health. The, the, the poor combustion is not only a contributor to poor health of the cooks, and usually the infant kids, which are next to them, uh, which, which leads to a lot of uh, diseases and uh, bad health outcomes, but also uh, a second most a second strongest climate forcing contributor uh, next only to carbon dioxide in terms of current contribution. Ramanathan and Carmichael's paper in Nature 2008 shows you here the, the optical depth of the atmosphere with biomass fuel cooking and without biomass fuel cooking over Asia, uh, holding constant the burning of diesel fuels and, and other open biomass burning like forest fires and so on. The, the idea here being to demonstrate how um, much more absorption there is from black uh, soot in the atmosphere as a result of biomass uh, burned for cooking. And that, of course, causes, uh, drives, is a driver for, for climate change. Okay, emissions from cooking, uh, the standard reference is Tammy Bond, her paper in 2004 in JGR doing a global inventory of black carbon emissions from combustion. Globally, about 30% of all black carbon emissions are attributed. This is an imperfect estimate, and she explains the uncertainties uh, in accounting. But 30% but of it comes from biomass cooking. Uh, and of course, the nature of the problem is that it's not just a perfect stove that we seek. Uh, we need a large number of stove designs, uh, even in the perfect world, because we are not looking for a single perfect design because of the diversity that I mentioned to you earlier, right? Uh, in the sense that you, uh, maybe I didn't mention this in writing, but the key point being is, it's not efficient stove that we seek, because efficient stove is meaningless by itself. It's really the combination of the fuel and the stove and the pot that leads to high or low efficiency. A stove that will uh, be uh, highly efficient using agricultural waste will perhaps or commonly do poorly uh, if the fuel was animal dung. And a stove that does very well for making rice in a pot uh, may not necessarily do well for making chapatis or rotis, which are flat Indian breads. So all of these factors matter, and we need to understand 
what is it that people are using the stove for? So normally speaking, people talk about just fuel, stove, pot combination. If we were to take a step back, really what matters is also the skill of the cook in tending the stove. That's a learned, learned skill. And as our students quickly find out, when they try to measure stove efficiency, their own performance or the stove's performance rapidly climbs in the first two weeks. And then it plateaus when they themselves learn how to use the stove. So there is no, you know, you can't simply throw a stove at somebody if it's an advanced uh, improved stove and expect that um, they, without training, without learning, the stove will perform well. So skill of the cook matters. And as I said, it's not just the pot, it's also the kind of food being cooked. Because if in that pot you are boiling water, as opposed to frying uh, onions, then the process is quite different. In, in boiling water, you need to bring it to boil and just simmer it if you're trying to make rice, for example. Holding it at 100 degrees Celsius is, or 98 degrees Celsius is good enough. If you're trying to fry onions on the other end, you need to drive the moisture out of the onions. So there's a latent heat of onions that, or, or the water in the onions, uh, which needs to be so, so it's the endothermic process as opposed to simply hydrolyzing the starch. You need to pay attention to that as well. So if you actually pay full attention to the process, it's five steps, starting from skill of the cook, then the fuel, then the stove, then the pot, then the kind of food that's being cooked and the process. Is it endothermic or not, okay? So that's, that's, that's the whole range. And then, of course, the new stuff must be clearly so much better than the current practice that that the, the users have to actually take to it, they have to favor it to the point of switching to it, which means that user preferences and user behavior must drive the design of the stove. And one of the common reasons why stove projects failed spectacularly in the 70s and 80s is because a bunch of engineering scientists designed stoves uh, in the labs uh, without paying attention to what the users wanted or without getting feedback from the users in terms of what they developed. Uh, and I think the, the differential, the, so, the social differential between the stove designers and the stove users was so large that there was nobody bridging the gap. Turns out that uh, stoves are, biomass stoves are commonly used in societies where women have less political and social power than men have. And all these engineering scientists designing stoves were usually men, and all the cooks were usually women. So there is one differential. The second differential was all these engineering scientists usually were college-educated faculty members or, or, or you know, PhD holders. And the women were typically unschooled altogether, often not able to read and write. So there's a second differential. And then there is a differential of uh, actually income, income gap in the sense these guys are rural poor and these are urban middle class. So these three barriers added up to be so much that the stoves perform very well in the lab, uh, but commonly failed in the field, giving the entire business of improving stoves a bad name. So we hope we do better this time, okay? Uh, lastly, each stove is a compromise between many, many design goals. Okay, uh, and for different prices, we'll have different solutions, even for the same fuel, same food, same pot, and same cooking method. And as an illustration, I bring your attention to design of passenger cars on the road, which have much less inherent diversity in driving on a standard American road from point A to point B, and see how many cars are out there, different models, right? And now we are talking about all this diversity so you could expect that we would have, even in the ideal world, need for several hundred stove designs, given all the diversity in this, plus user preferences. Okay? And, and so the weakness of the current situation is that uh, we don't have good design tools. We actually don't have even one good design tool. All the design tools that we have for good stoves come from empirical testing rather than and kind of rules of thumb derived from people who did a lot of 
kind of stove development work who say, you know what, the gap between the pot and the upper lip of the stove should be about between one and two centimeters. But that doesn't pay attention to what's the height of the air, hot air column and what's going to be the temperature of the column and how much insulation have you got which will cause the air to lose temperature as it comes up, what's your going to be heat transfer, none of that goes in there. So we, what we need really, of course we understand all the basic stuff quite well. Integration is very hard because we don't currently have a model that, that's integrated model that can be used and that's the kind of stuff that places like Stanford and places like Berkeley can produce, right? But we haven't got it out there which can actually do a validated user-friendly tool that's either in public domain or is affordably licensed for those guys who will do the 100 stoves and, and design them and field test them and correct them and iterate so that all those designs will be out there. That knowledge is currently missing in terms of how do we go beyond the currently mostly empirical kind of rules of thumb method. So there's a huge pressing large engineering problem that remains unsolved today. Uh, the progress is really slow. I have a, a little group that, that is trying to add a wood paralysis model to a public domain fire model and it's, it's really hard progress because the public domain models tend to have substantial underinvestment when it comes to user friendliness. And the, the commercial models are so much superior in terms of grid generation that if I want to change the, the height of the stove or the diameter of the stove in a public domain model, uh, it's like pulling teeth. <laughs> and, and going to a commercial model maybe is a good way to go, but then the license cost could be very high. So we got to solve that problem and actually come to a point where it's, it's validated. Okay. Um, and then of course, not only we want an experimental validation of what happens in uh, in a lab, but often what happens in the lab doesn't compare very well or is, is a poor predictor of what happens in the field because consistently we haven't figured out how to mimic in the lab what's happening in the field, even in terms of the mean in the lab and mean in the field. And I'll give you some example from our own experience. So we also need better test methods experimentally of how do we capture what's happening in the field well enough that experimental methods to mimic what's happening in the field can be done in the lab to be a useful guide. And that is not working out well. In other words, the EPA dynamometer is not giving you the right MPG in terms of how the car drives on the road, okay? Uh, and this is all essential if you want to get to that point. So in terms of design and manufacturing of stoves, my personal preference is because we are talking about uh, deep rural countryside areas which run on biomass at the bottom two billion people in economic terms. I like to have something without moving parts. I like to have something with no dampers to open and close and adjust. Though it's not like they cannot do it. It's a change of behavior significantly away from what they currently do. And a behavior change of the cook is a much larger uphill enterprise. I would like the stove to be so uh, robust in design. Maybe we can put in a, 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 an automatic damper that is temperature sensitive using some memory metal. That's different. But if you, if you want somebody to read some dial and do some adjustment, it's, it's not going to happen without an enormous cost in terms of education and training. Uh, what's much worse is the cost to the end user which is 1.6 million deaths per year, estimated by WHO, uh, from smoke inhalation. The cost to the end user is not perceived by the end user to be a true cost. So in some sense, it's not taken up by the end user as saying, oh my God, I really need to stop smoking because now everybody knows smoking is bad for you. That's not clearly the case in the two billion people who end up having smoky kitchens. So all of this needs to happen in a way where the perceived benefit, which is usually either cash or cooking time or labor to collect wood, that's your only driver for now, unless we make a very strong effort to educate them how bad the smoke inhalation is, okay? So the final product, of course, needs close tolerances in some dimensions, we all know that. 
And my preference is not to make it artisanal. Uh, artisanal refers to a, a, an idea where you let the village artisans locally make the stoves, and you have, you know, what, 100,000 villages, and everybody, every village has an artisan who makes a stove, and, you know, you leave it to good luck that the stove will be good. Uh, I would rather figure out a way in which uh, uh, somehow there will be some standardization uh, at the same time, reduction of cost without uh, a loss of control or loss of skills from the local artisans. And you'll see what we ended up doing for, for Darfur. And I think we kind of touched on this already, that our smartest scientific efforts in the lab, uh, whether it's software, whether it's, it's integrated engineering in terms of heat transfer and combustion and emissions or design are worthless unless users accept the stove. And, and that leads us to our Darfur work, keeping the users at the center. In this case, the users are the, the women uh, and girls of Darfur. And the reason the project started was because of the systematic rape and violence against the women refugees in Darfur that was uh, perpetrated by the Janjaweed. Uh, and uh, effectively what has happened is uh, there are about 2.7 million refugees now in Darfur. 80% of them are women or girls because men have been mostly killed. Uh, and the women are in uh, desert-like uh, environment uh, in camps, crowded camps, where uh, United Nations provides them with food rations, uh, but without a fuel to cook the food. And they must leave the safety of the camps uh, for gathering the fuel wood when they are systematically attacked or have been systematically attacked by the Janjaweed, which lies in wait for them. Uh, a typical trip is seven hours, a typical trip uh, or every other day to collect uh, the field wood. So I got a phone call saying, what can you do about this? Uh, uh, back in 2005, I went to Darfur first time and organized a systematic survey to find out what fuel do they use, what kind of pots do they use, how much fuel do they cook with, what's the food, what's their cooking process, um, we went there with electronic balances and measuring cups and, and measuring tapes and, 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 and spent uh, a couple of weeks doing a statistical survey in South Darfur and North Darfur and brought together data with the means and standard deviations of all the critical parameters, brought back parts from Darfur. Uh, here, this circle just shows a woman with a baby on her back, and that just gives you an idea of the kind of hardship that's suffered by everybody. Uh, these, are, these are women coming back with wood on their heads, and this is coming back to Otash camp in, in South Darfur. Uh, now, what has happened is, of course, this ever larger zone of complete biological denudation around the camps has grown so much that uh, wood is almost inaccessible now for North Darfur, which is closer to the Sahara Desert. And uh, most of the families, 80% of them, have taken to selling part of their food rations to middlemen, who of course will scurry it out of the camp and sell it into the cities. Uh, and with the cash that they earn from selling their food rations, these women buy fuel wood from other middlemen with which to cook the remainder of their food. So we also did surveys about those percentages. We asked them how, what fraction of, or, or did you miss a meal in the last seven days? Uh, for lack of fuel, and astoundingly high number, 50% and plus uh, above, had missed a meal because of lack of fuel to cook. And, and so, so there, is, there is a lot of hardship in, in the strangest ways in terms of what is going on there. Here is a Darfur uh, pot. Turns out in Darfur there are only a limited number of pot sizes, which helped us a lot. They're all cast aluminum pots. And uh, there is a small pot in which they make the sauce where they fry onions and a little bit of yogurt, if they can get yogurt, and their spices, which they pound. And that sauce is in the small pot. And in the large pot, they uh, throw in flour and water. And this whole thing is boiled while it's being stirred. So a mass of dough is prepared that is already cooked by the, by the, in 15 minutes. 
And this dough and a saw, the, the, the dough is called asida, the sauce is called mula, and this is the meal, this is it. So we mimic that by careful measurements back in Berkeley in their part so that we can actually begin to understand what's going on. Uh, so this, is, this was kind of my way of figuring out back in 2005 that yes, indeed, there is a, there is a weak link because three stone fires are only about five to 7% efficient. So here was a soft spot in that causation chain that led to rape and hardship and humiliation. The reason that 20% of the men don't go out to collect wood is because if they leave the camps and they are caught, they are just killed on the spot. So the choice is very hard for these families, either their brothers and sons or, or husbands if they survive. If they leave the camps, they are risking their life literally. If the women leave the camp, it is a for, you know, fate worse than death in those cultures. Uh, for a woman to be marked as somebody who has been raped means social rejection from her family and entire kinship. So either way, it's a very hard uh, setup. And our goal at that time was we didn't want to invent one more stove because there have been programs, as I mentioned to you, failed programs. Nevertheless, there have been programs to make stoves. There are you know, dozens of stoves, fuel efficient biomass stoves, if you, if you check it on the web. So we took a bunch of stoves with us, and here is a locally made Darfur stove with donkey dung and mud kneaded together and made into this cylindrical shape uh, with three bricks at the bottom, which you can barely see, to support a pot and a little grate at the back. And here is a stove made with stone, powder, and cement. Uh, this is a, a mild steel stove uh, made in India called Tara, and this is a rocket stove uh, with Aprovecho. So we actually took a Tara and Aprovecho, and we tested both of them. We tested this stove, we took another stove made in India uh, by their Combustion Research Institute, uh, and we found that none of them were really satisfactory. Uh, so our, our initial goal was just to find the, the right stove, and we told them, actually, I don't have to go, you know. You take these stoves and you test them, and whatever works, you run with it. And uh, NGOs, who are the who are the ones who, whom we dealt with, basically said they don't have the technical capacity to, to do this. So it ended up saying, we'll have to go. So that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I got into it. It turned out to be deep, you know, longer and deeper <laughs> problem than it appeared. You know, I thought I'll be done with it in three, four months. Uh, <laughs> so. So this, this Tara stove was what cost $10 Indian metal stove. We could actually cut the fuel wood use in half, but this wasn't good enough because it was mechanically unstable. And if wind blows, and these people live in uh, pretty, you know, essentially sticks and tarp uh, shelters, so there's a lot of wind six months of the year. If wind blows, it essentially blows the heat away. So it needs a collar which would protect uh, the heat transfer. And so we said, well, now we've got to modify this. Here is a side-by-side -side testing of the stoves. Here is a Tara stove. There is a three-stone fire. We had measured wood given to groups of local women. Uh, it was pre-weighed, and then they cooked their food in their pots using their fuel on all four stoves in parallel. And then we found that among the four that we had tested, uh, this was the best among the lot, but still not good enough. So we started building on this stove to say, well, let's, let's add whatever we need to do. So here is a group of Berkeley students trying to mimic wind in, <laughs> wind in the Sahara <laughs> with a table fan. And there's a little anemometer that you can barely see, making sure it's five miles per hour coming at the <laughs> <laughs> And here's a thermocouple and all this stuff going on. But when it led to a stove, 2006. We worked with Engineers Without Borders, San Francisco professional chapter, because we had a stove, but it was all hand-built. And we had no way to figure out how to make it into hundreds of thousands of stoves unless we worked with people who do manufacturing. And, and these professional people had a much better idea of how to reduce the number of parts, whether you should be doing welding or riveting or whatever you need to do. So essentially, go to people who know more than you do. <laughs> that's, that's always a good solution to solve difficult and complicated problems. So, so essentially, they knew how to do quality control, uh, design for production, metalworking. And they redesigned this to simplify the fabrication, lot, took a lot of testing. And then uh, this is what the version 5 
of the stove looks like. And here's a group of people from uh, Berkeley and uh, Engineers Without Borders uh, uh, coming together to, to do the V5. In December, we are ready to test the stoves. We built 50 of those in Khartoum and, and distributed these to these women who are you know, coming nicely dressed. This is in Darfur. And we said, well, the ideal stuff is uh, get a half of an oil drum cut and then fill it with stones or so you have a little platform on which you can cook. Uh, and here is their, you know, one of those teams very proudly saying, we'll, we'll test the stoves for six weeks. The deal was at the end of six weeks, they'll return the stoves back with some comments of how it works and so on. So when they actually, here is the stove, the way it was actually being used uh, uh, in January 2007, when they came back, we had a surprise for them. Uh, we said, you don't have to give the stove back. You can actually pay $5, which is twice the local price of scrap metal. If you pay $5, you can keep the stove. So that was our way to find out, is it worth anything to them after six weeks of cooking on it daily, okay? And to our great happiness, you know, all 50 of them shared out $5, which is really terrific. Come to think of people who are so destitute on the brink of existence there, uh, that was worthwhile for them to actually buy the stove for more than the price of scrap metal. And of course, they needed some more changes, so we, we continue to improve the stove. Currently, we are on V14, the 14th uh, iteration of the major modifications of the stove. It's ready for limited mass production. Our estimate is each stove would save about $250 per year of fuel wood. As I, as I indicated, a lot of people in not Darfur uh, buy the wood. Uh, it's more stable, it is simpler to build, and the idea is we can make flat kits, IKEA style, out of sheet metal, punch them out, uh, and assemble the stoves in Darfur, okay? Uh, our estimate at that time was that each stove will double the disposable income uh, of the refugees, and 250 per year times five year lifetime, it will save them uh, 1250 over the five year life of the stove. And we asked them, what would you do if you had, uh, if you had to use half the fuel wood? Or what would you do if you had to, okay? And we got a diversity of answers. Some of them said, well, you know, uh, we would use the money to get clothes for our kids or buy them some fresh vegetables or meat. Some of them said, we will just rest because women are just exhausted. So, so that told us that they were not trying to game this situation because they're just exhausted, having to go every other day for long treks. So we set up a memorandum of understanding with Oxfam America to build a Darfur stoves in the field with the flat kits. We provided all the tools, we provided all the training. I've had a long association with Stanford in this project, I'm happy to say. Uh, even the first 50 stoves that you saw were built in Khartoum, were built with an engineer from Stanford because at that level, it's not like football, okay? We are working together. <laughs> so it's been a very nice, positive, collaborative relationship in many, 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 many areas. So uh, Brian Tachibana was the engineer from Stanford who went to Khartoum to build a first 50 stoves. And then Scott Sadlon was also an engineer from Stanford, I mean, graduated from Stanford who went to Darfur to set up the first uh, training and the tools. Uh, so we qualified an Indian factory to make these flat kits. The flat kits cost $14, and they can make 5,000 of them per month on a single production line, on a single shift. So um, here's a CNC machine uh, that punches, uh, that, that makes the dies. And with the die, you can essentially stamp out the flat kits very rapidly and precisely. It has uh, 124 little holes so that they line up uh, to make 62 rivet spots and then you can rivet it. So that's, that's the idea and it is very, very precisely done. And we have a video, I hope it works, of how this process works. Let us see, here we go. So you actually have this uh, hydraulic press and um, there are two workers who, who do this. They, they bring the flat kits in from that side, one by one, put it under this, under this press, and uh, 
you would see he has got to position it just right so as to reduce wastage of metal. And um, uh, this was filmed in December and I was impressed uh, that even in December in Mumbai, uh, the factory was paying enough attention to actually have these guys a little table fan to keep them, keep the workers cool. I mean, one of my reasons to go there was to make sure there is no labor violations of anything that will embarrass us later. <laughs> so here is the table fan. <laughs> so, so they punch the, punch the flat kits and then the flat kits get uh, assembled, uh, put on uh, uh, put on a container, uh, sent to Port Sudan. Uh, from Port Sudan, they are put on a truck. Uh, that's the point where we donate these flat kits to Oxfam America once they are cleared customs, and then they give it to a local Sudanese nonprofit to assemble them into stoves. And that uh, assembly shop is in Darfur, uh, where. Local refugees from a local camp have been trained by Scott Sadlon to assemble stoves. So these are the first thousand stoves. These are actually the first four stoves that were built when Scott went there. And are, these are very proud people showing off what they have done. Uh, in October 2009, we built a thousand. Uh, the, the capacity actually we can build a stove every five minutes as opposed to that mud and dung stove that takes three days by the time it's ready to be used. And that cracks and is ruined in about six months time. Uh, so here is now a movie made by Scott in 2009 when he got the workshop going. And I don't know uh, how he's going to show, but here we go. I don't know if you can hear this. I don't know where the speaker is. And then goes to the first two assembly stations where the body is installed onto the grate. Next, the pot support rods are put on at this station. Pot support tabs and handle brackets are made. See, the hand tools are pretty straightforward. The collar, the top of the stove, is being folded. And here the feet are being made. On each stability foot, a unique serial number is included so that we can keep track of the quality of the stove. So each stove has a serial number so we can track what happens, and I'll come to that in a minute. And the only mechanized assembly is the, is the air pressure line with which they, they do the uh, steel rivets. And finally, the stoves are sent to the inspection station. And traditionally, in Darfur, women don't do metal work, but we have two women for quality control at the start and at the end point. And if the stove is not good enough, it is sent back to be redone. So that's the Oxfam America and the Darfur stoves effort. So, uh, of course, we, 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 in parallel, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we set up a, a, a station to test for efficiency and emissions. Uh, this is the fume hood. You see the glow of the fire there, uh, but you don't see the stove because that's behind the student. Uh, and, uh, and the air goes around and, and it's expelled, and, and we measure a whole bunch of things. What do we measure at a one hertz frequency? We measure CO and CO2 with a non-dispersive infrared analyzer. We measure black carbon. Uh, we, may, we measure the scattering coefficient and absorption coefficients for single scattering albedo. We measure the absorption angstrom coefficient and PM 2.5 mass. And that's, that's very good at this frequency. And then integrated, we again measure PM 2.5 and the black carbon and, and the wood and its moisture content. So all of this. Uh, this is the kind of science end of, of the project, which, which supports what you're doing. And we still are not at a point where what we measure in the lab is good enough uh, to, to eyes closed predict what will happen in the field. 
And that's something we, we haven't paid attention to because how fast we have kind of tried to push this. But we need to fix that and we need to address that. And of course, I mentioned to you already that there is no model, uh, engineering model, which actually integrates combustion, convection, radiation, uh, heat transfer uh, with the stove and the pyrolysis and all of this either. Okay, so. Uh, here is a comparison between Berkeley Darfur stove and the three stone fire. So it does cook quicker indeed. Here are uh, 21 runs, the red lines, and it finishes cooking in this, in this broad zone. And you can see the diversity even with trained students. So we throw away the first semester worth of tests from any new student. <laughs> because that's just training, okay? <laughs> And, and this is the black lines, and, and this is this width is the time it takes to cook. To, to, and the cook is not really cook, it's heat 2.5 liters of water from room temperature, bring it to boil, and simmer for 15 minutes. That's the test. Okay? So it cooks faster, the temperature rises higher, 73% is the time. And actually, when we ask the women in Darfur, what would you call this stove? Because they cannot say Berkeley Darfur stove. They, <laughs> they, they call it Kanun uh, Hamsagai, which means five minute stove. So for them, that was the most important thing. Actually, it turns out it doesn't save five minutes, but, or it doesn't cook in five minutes, but that was the implication. That's, that's the way they named it, okay? Uh, this, of course, hits 100. And the last, the, the slowest temperature line of the red hits 100 Celsius there. The fastest of them touches 100 Celsius there, okay? And same thing goes, the fastest rising black line touches 100 Celsius here, and the slowest of them touches 100 Celsius there. And it uses less fuel. We replicated tests. Again, these are not training tests. These are real after training, okay? You can still see the broad diversity of what what happens, it uses 65% wood. Berkeley Darfur stove uses 65% wood using the mean of these tests as, as a normalizing factor. In the field, actually it turns out that Berkeley Darfur stove, stove saves more than half. Uh, and here it says that it shows, it saves less than half. So there is, there is a little bit of disconnect, but the field performance is slightly better, okay? Uh, and this is n equal to 20, n equal to 21. This is a fraction of cooking tests. And then, of course, it cooks, it cooks cleaner as well in terms of, uh, in this case, you are looking at mass of CO2 emitted during the test. Uh, this stove emits a lot less uh, carbon monoxide than that does. And in fact, you look at grams of CO, the, the grams of CO emitted is smaller than the grams of wood consumed, suggesting or, or showing to you that, uh, in fact, grams of CO per kilogram of wood is also lower. So it, of course, burns, burns cleaner as well. Uh, so field survey results. And ultimately, what matters to the end user is how much money they save, OK? So 2010, we conducted a survey in Zamzam camp of 600 women who received the stoves. Uh, and of those, we surveyed 100, baseline survey. And then in July, we conducted, we went back and did, uh, uh, revisited them. And per the data, uh, their share, the fuel wood share went down from 33% to 15%. Each $25 stove actually saves more than our initial estimate. You recall, we thought $250 per, uh, per year would be the savings. Uh, this survey uh, is 330 per year, uh, which means it's worth more than $1,600 over the stove life of five years. The longest that we have seen the stoves in the field are, have been in use for three years, and they don't show any degradation other than rust that we expected all along, because these are just mild steel stoves, not galvanized or stainless steel, except for the firebox, which is stainless steel, 430 grade. Uh, so as of this month, we have 16,000 stoves in the field. Uh, each the average family size is seven. So number of people helped in terms of reduced risk or reduced uh, risk to their family members is more than 100,000. 
Since each stove saves $1,600, the stove distributed so far, that is 16,000 times 1,600, is a lot of money worth to the recipients. And we expect to do more than 10,000 stoves this year, of which 4,000 are already built, and they are being distributed as we speak, and we expect to push forward and do more. And I think we'll exceed 10,000 this year too. This is a website where you'll find lots of information, whatever we can post, uh, darfurstoves.org. Uh, it is not operated through Lawrence Berkeley National Lab because we are a national lab and we must uh, obey the federal government's restrictions against sending even a paper clip to Sudan because it's, uh, it's a country designated to be sponsoring terrorism. So you can't send anything there. So now there is a site outside. Uh, it's a non-profit, 501c3, that can send money to India to build flat kits, which can then be donated to Oxfam America, and everything is legal. <laughs> and this is just an overview. In, in the initial stages, we were helping another NGO, uh, CHF, uh, uh, in terms of they decided they want to build a stoves by cutting steel by hand uh, tools in Darfur. They didn't want to follow this manuf half manufactured model. The stoves turned out to be not so good and they could make only 200 per month because they're cutting steel by hand clip. This is just a terrible way to go, I think. Uh, but then in 2009, CHF got thrown out of Sudan um, along with a number of other nonprofits uh, by the president, Mr. Bashir, when he was uh, charged by the court, international court in The Hague. So with that, we started working with Oxfam and we said, you know, this is not the way to go. Let's just do a flat kits assembly there and, and make this work. And that seems to have worked very well. So that's the last slide I have and I'll be happy to take questions. I think we are doing okay. Okay, we try to take the students first since this is a class. How about you back there? Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I think there's, has there been any attempt to scale this kind of, this particular project globally? And to do that, I wonder if you need any, some local innovations and do you have ways to drive the local innovation so that it can be scaled to other regions globally? The question is about uh, trying to scale the project globally uh, and about local innovations. Uh, we have received a number of requests to take this stove to other countries, but we have generally been reluctant to do so until the work in Darfur got stable, because Darfur is the hardest problem to solve in many ways. Uh, it is under civil war conditions on and off. Uh, the government is sometimes unfriendly. Uh, we don't really have government support locally, right? Uh, is, is really hard. And the people are in a much worse shape than people in, say, a, a, a more stable, non-refugee condition. So we felt in many ways obligated to stay focused until we figure out how to make this work. Now we think it is working well. We actually accepted to work in neighboring Ethiopia, where uh, the forest cover has gone from about 50% in the middle of last century to 5% by 2005. But still 80% of the people cook on fuel wood. So in many ways in Ethiopia, their back is to the wall in very difficult conditions. But it's a stable civil society. And it's a stove that we could potentially modify to work in Ethiopia. And the population is much larger. Uh, so we are working with another nonprofit and, and testing the stoves, and, and I think we have something that is useful for Ethiopian conditions. Again, we went out the same thing. Went out there, got the pots back. We went in there with measuring tapes and stopwatches and electronic balances <laughs> and measured what goes in and what comes out of the cooking protocols and built a synthetic cooking protocol for the lab, and we think we have, we have some project uh, success there. Great. 
Okay, how about back there and then over there? Uh, so you briefly explained why you chose not to produce in Darfur, uh, but I was curious what barriers led you to produce in India rather than in neighboring Egypt or Kenya that has a somewhat developed manufacturing sector? Was it purely economic or were there other issues involved? Yeah, the question is about why do we choose to do the stamping in India rather than Egypt or, or some other nearby country? We actually looked at production costs in different areas, uh, including Sudan. And it turns out that the cheapest way to do this, including transport costs, is either India or China, including transport to Sudan. Uh, way, way cheaper than anything that can be done in, uh, in neighboring African countries. We chose India over China for primarily two reasons. One is, uh, in India, the language of business is English, and it's a little easier for us to go around compared to China. Secondly, the Chinese have an interest in Sudanese oil, and they have been cooperating with the government of Sudan, and we don't want to risk uh, that kind of, take that political risk. So India, on the other hand, is, is completely dispersed, and there is no government of India to government of Sudan kind of strong connection that would cause us worry. Okay. All right, next, uh, yeah. Um, actually, two quick questions. Uh, how, how sustainable do you think this project is on the long term? I mean, basically, it's a great idea that you have found an urgency and you're addressing this urgency and you're distributing all of these stores. But on the long term, are you still going to be going with the mentality of going with a perfect kit where people don't really know how to do on their own to, like, you know, and basically shipping it for support from the US, pieces from India? back to Sudan, which is kind of all over the world. Um, this is one question. The second question is, have you um, like, basically sought any uh, financial support from organizations in neighboring countries? OK, the second question is easy to answer. Have we got any financial support from anybody in neighboring countries, neighboring to Sudan, or neighboring to the US? Sudan. Zero. We don't even know whom to ask. If you have some ideas, let's talk offline, OK? <laughs> right. The first question is more complicated about the sustainability of, of this project. And you, you raise several layers of questions. And I have strong opinions on some of them and not so strong on others. Okay? Uh, for one thing, the sustainability of the project in the long run, there are only 2.7 people, million people there. Okay? So we need only 400,000 stops of that order. And it's not a whole lot. It's something that the US can do, or, or civil population can do, literally like this. We spend, what, $30 billion on dog food in this country? <laughs> you know that? We really can do this if we wanted to. It's not hard. And we can do 10,000 stores now uh, without mounting a major PR effort. But if you were to go more aggressively and, and raise more money, one can do this. That's, that's point one. Point two, I feel strongly that, uh, well, let, let me finish on, on, the, on the, the issue of money. Uh, because the Darfur stoves are avoiding the use of non-renewable biomass, or NRB as called in the in the, in the Kyoto protocols. Uh, you actually can take credit for the avoided CO2 emissions in addition to taking credits for avoided black soot, avoided methane, avoided NOx, and so on. It all adds up to two tons of CO2 equivalent per year per stove. Okay? If we were to sell these, capture these credits and sell them in the voluntary emissions reductions, the ER market in Europe, for example, where VERs are already traded. A VER uh, sells for, a say, let us say, I don't know, $10 a ton. The price goes up and down all the time, right? But take a number, $10 a ton. So each, each stove would be providing $20 uh, in terms of VERs. Five years, that is $100. That's way more than the cost of the stove. So we could finance this through carbon credits offsets altogether if we were to work that way. Uh, a question you, you asked uh, also 
I thought uh, was critical of the fact that this is a multinational project now, with the design being done in the US, the, the electronic file is sent to India, they, they stamp this out once they make the tool, the flat kits go to Sudan and so on. To that, all I have to answer is, for every dollar that goes into this project, I would like to get the maximum mileage out in terms of what can be done for the refugees in Sudan. So if in India, I get a cast iron grade for two US dollars, okay, and a whole kit cost me $14 at Port Sudan, whereas in Sudan, when I make the same grade, it cost me $8, just the grade alone. And a flat kit cost $60. We did all these numbers, and not only did we do them, after we did all the numbers, Oxfam America hired an independent Sudanese consultant, a fellow called Dr. Ahmed Hood, to look into how to lower the costs. And he looked at all possible production options once again, and that was back in 2009, 2010, and he came to the conclusion that this model is the cheapest you could come up with too. So if, if my focus is to help the largest number of refugees now, I would not worry about if it is multinational or single nation. That's my take on it. Okay, questions. Okay, uh, we'll take over there and then we'll open it up to everybody. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. This is extremely inspiring and I've worked for years in Eastern Africa and in Tanzania and parts of Kenya, we believe that the major environmental impact of fuel use is charcoal made out in the village and then shipped into the urban areas. And I was wondering if on your trajectory is a charcoal efficient um, stove. The question is about charcoal efficient stoves. Uh, actually, we are already into charcoal stoves. It turns out that after we have this traction on, on fuel wood burning stoves in, in first in uh, uh, Sudan and then in Ethiopia now, uh, uh, we had this horrible earthquake in Haiti. And uh, one of the outcomes of the earthquake was a request to the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab from a powerful, influential senator's office saying, make sure that when we rebuild in Haiti, uh, we don't do low efficiency charcoal stoves again. So since we heard you do stoves, why don't you try to do something about it? So we, you know, got on the plane in a hurry and sent students to Haiti. And they came back saying, look, we don't need to redesign stoves all over again because there are like three dozen NGOs working in Haiti. And each one of them is already promoting an efficient, quote unquote, efficient charcoal stove without ability to test them or compare them. Whatever they could grab, they all figured that they should do an efficient stove anyway. So whatever stove they came up with, or whosoever kind of offered it to them and they believed, they picked up and they started distributing those stoves. So our question was, what value do we add? Do we need to redesign? Why should we redesign one more stove? Why should we, if there are two dozen stoves, why should we do the 25th one, right? So our value added at that time was to provide independent, credible, level field testing of efficiency and emissions of charcoal burning stoves being distributed in Haiti. So we offered to the nonprofits in Haiti that if they ship us a stove, uh, we, we, we went and measured the protocol the same way I described to you earlier, you know, stopwatch, measuring tape, <laughs> electronic balance, all the rest of it. Uh, but we have a very good emissions measuring setup and, emis and a, an efficiency testing setup. So we built a lab protocol, which is a surrogate of a typical cooking cycle in Haiti. And we, had, we tested some six, seven stoves now. And one stove actually stands out better than the rest, and the rest of them are about the same. Uh, and one is actually worse than the traditional stove the Haitians use. <laughs> but Haitians don't know that. So, so we did something. We, 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 we did the best we could in terms of value added. Okay, all right, yeah, I think you were, yeah, go ahead. To the extent that pollution inside the, uh, the home is a major issue, are you driven to external venting or is there some hope of doing a good job without external venting? 
<laughs> it is possible to do a very good job without external vending if you have a tiny little bit of electrical power. With a five watt fan, you can reduce emissions by 90%. And that has been demonstrated by various people who have actually built those stoves. Though again, a generalized model is lacking. They're actually built and shown this. Now in Darfur, there is no electricity to speak of. So we are doing the best we can. And the natural convection is very hard because you need to have the stove perform well over a range of thermal power outputs and efficiency and emissions will vary over the thermal outputs. And natural convection stoves by their very nature are very hard to make efficient beyond certain limit. Uh, it is possible to do vented stoves. Of course, there are chimney stoves which are promoted in India and Central America and elsewhere and they at least throw the pollution out which means the cooks don't have to breathe it and obviously there are immediate local benefits. Okay, all right, next, how about right here? Uh, um, you mentioned Opera Vecho Institute early on, and it wasn't clear to me whether you chose their stove or the Indian stove. But my next question is, given that they are working in Darfur as well, they're working on more of an institutional stove, I'm wondering how your work would overlap with theirs, if there's a collaboration, and how in the refugee camps they decide whether families cook individually or together for an institutional stove makes more sense. Oh. It's hard to answer the latter question because it really depends on how the refugee camp is organized and to what, what extent there is coherence in a community uh, because these people have their homes burned down and they, they trek long distances with whatever they can save and arrive at a refugee camp where they check in and they're all given little kind of ration cards with which they will, and then they figure out uh, where they are going to put up a little stick and stones hut and they go and collect a tarp from the nonprofits which operate there. So building of a community with enough uh, cohesion and organization to do a community cooking is a whole higher level of operation. So it's hard to answer that question flat out. But I think in Darfur is not going to be easy. Uh, folks at Aprovecho are good friends. I mean, I know Dean Steele for a long time. I took a rocket stove there all the way uh, it turns out to be totally inappropriate for conditions in Darfur because the rocket stove has a tall, uh, tall stack inside beyond that stainless steel throat. And the acida that they make in Darfur, which is the bread dough that I mentioned is done on fire, has to be stirred in the pot while it is on fire and has to be stirred vigorously, otherwise it burns because there is no possible convective mixing. So you have this stick with both hands with a lot of force with which the woman is pushing that bread dough around that round bottom part while it is hot. And if you try to do that on a tall stove, you need an enormous uh, structural support to keep it there. So, so it just wasn't going to fly. So that's why we didn't go with that design. We actually started with the Tara stove, which is the Indian stove, and, and built on that design. A Tara stove itself is actually built on a, a, a model developed out of Vita. So it's a Vita stove design that was modified by the Indians, uh, which became the Tara stove, which we modified, and so on. Okay, we'll take one more question. Okay, Gil, how about you? Um, have you looked at the potential increased efficiency that would be associated with heat exchangers on the bottoms of the pots. We focused on the stove, but didn't mention the pot itself. We haven't looked at it, but some people have, and it's really a good way to go, obviously. Uh, the, the current pots in Darfur are all cast aluminum, so it'll be relatively easy to add external fins to the pot, for example, or do some modifications of those. We haven't done that only because our intervention is trying to reduce capital cost. So our idea is to take out a three stone and already this $20 for, or $25, of which we hope they will pay five and 10. Uh, but uh, the, the pot really would, would make a huge difference, uh, a pot with fins, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, one has to again do the trade-offs between, uh, and the marketing of, but, but sure, that's a, that's a great opportunity. In fact, there was a Stanford student who was looking into that, yeah. Okay. okay. All right, well, we do have a social, and, uh, and Ashok will be there, but uh, for now, let's thank him for a great talk. Thank you.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.